Well, I really enjoyed the series we did on the Great Commission. I thought it was so much fun and was enjoyable. I enjoyed last week. I think uh, it was pointed out that I obviously enjoyed myself um, looking at the need for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. For us to fulfill that which God has called us to do, we need to be empowered. When we look at the big picture, when we look at what Jesus has done to advance his kingdom, we desperately need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. But we're going to start a new series today, which is came out of the discussions, which is we're all back together now. We're not on Zoom. You know, I know still some are watching online, but on the whole, we're back together. And it was kind of, well, what does that mean? What, what is different about being back together than watching on Zoom? And there's one very big difference. And that is, our bodies are here. So suddenly, our bodies and who we are and what we bring into the room is here. And so we're going to do a series looking at bodies in the Bible. Sounds great, isn't it? I'm starting it on hands. And the trouble is, all week, whenever I've been thinking hands, I keep going back to a fairy liquid advert, which is hands that do dishes. And I just found myself singing that the whole time. It's been really, really annoying, including the classic line, which is, can make your hands as mild as your face. It's such a weird line, isn't it? Why would you... No, as mild. As mild as your face. Some advertising person came up with that. Hands that do dishes, you wash this, and can be as soft as your face. Well, I don't know if my face is that mild, really. But anyway, that's something. But when we look at the subject of hands I'm going to look at today, there are 1,294 passages in the Bible about hands. So I hope you're sitting comfortably. (laughs) We'll start with the first of those. No, I'm going to just pick up on a few things. But hands have been talked about a lot during COVID. In fact, our first hint that something was happening was when Boris Johnson started telling us you need to wash your hands while singing happy birthday twice to ensure that you do them long enough. My favourite story of that time was from Heather's sister, who in a service station went and was washing hands, and there was a woman washing hands next to her, and Heather's sister turned and said, did you sing happy birthday while washing your hands? To which the woman looked at her and said, I didn't realise it was your birthday, and walked off. (laughs) When things go wrong. Hands. So we want to keep them clean. I, um, I used to do mine. I used to run a theatre company called One Stage Theatre Company, and I used to do mine. And uh, it's hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> Me not speaking and doing mine in silence. And I used to do that until one day a friend of mine, Lex, prophesied over me that God's saying, it's time to start using your mouth and start <laughs> preaching, and it's what you're more naturally supposed to do. I'm the only mime who would ever tell you what I'm doing. I'm in a box right now. <laughs> But hands, they can hurt and they can comfort. So I want to kind of call this, what is in your hands? What has God given you? In Exodus 4 verse 2, God looks at Moses and says to him, the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? And Moses said, a staff. So this is The message I want to bring to you today as we start this series is that God puts things in our hands. God has given gifts right around, and I'm going to spend more time looking at that. The beauty of a new covenant church, other than the old covenant, is this, that God has sent his spirit and all of us have been gifted. All of us can hear God. So the joy of leading a new community in the new covenant is this. You're not the only one who hears God. So for Moses, God's spoken to me, so we're doing this. You know, and we've got to recognise in the new covenant is that the Spirit of God comes on all flesh. All of us can hear God. The joy of leading is to hear as a body what is it that God is speaking to us. But this is the thing that is amazing. God uses ordinary people with ordinary abilities and can make them extraordinary. God takes the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. And so I want us today to look at 
What is it that God has given you? And how can you use that for the glory of God? Firstly, though, I want to start with this. God takes ordinary hands and makes them holy. You know, we've just been worshipping. And uh, we lift up our arms. The Bible talks about we lift up holy hands to God. In Psalm 28, verse 2, it says this, Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands towards the most holy sanctuary. 1 Timothy 2, verse 8, says this, I desire that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands to God. I love the fact that God takes the ordinary, and because of what Jesus has done, your hands have become holy. When we are filled with the Spirit, when the Spirit of God comes upon us, we are now people who are the the living temple of the Holy Spirit. Our hands are holy, which is why in worship we lift our hands. In fact, if you look through the 1,290 verses, it's amazing how many of them are about lift up your hands. Lift up your hands in worship. Lift up. We're, We're to express the joy of the Lord is our strength, and we express it in worship. We lift up holy hands. But isn't it remarkable that hands that can do so much wrong, you know, hands that can cause so much deceit and can cause us to to sin and things, are also the things that, because of what Christ has done, has made us holy. You know, lifting up holy hands puts it right in essence. You are now righteous before God because of what Jesus has done. You know, as I looked at last week, in Romans it says, you were in Adam... But because of what Christ has done, you're now in Christ. You are now clothed in righteousness. You can now enter the presence of God and lift up your hands in worship. You know, in in Romans 12, verse 1, it says, I urge you, present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. As your spiritual act of worship, do not compromise to to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your hands. We can now, renewing of your lives, not hands, but actually we can now stand righteous before God and lift up holy hands. God takes the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. Ordinary hands are now holy because of what Jesus has done. But here are some examples of people in the Bible who what they had in their hand was just ordinary suddenly became extraordinary. And I use that verse right at the start where God looks at Moses and says to him, what have you got in your hand? Now, I just want to point out, God did know what he had in his hand. Right? He wasn't like, you know, I've, I've done that. When you, when you have five children, there are lots of times you say, what have you got in your hand? What are, and, and you haven't got a clue, but you've got a suspicion you're going around a shop. There may well be something that's about to end up in the basket. You say, what is it? What have you got? Nothing, nothing, nothing. But actually, it's not that God's looking at Moses saying, what's that in your hand? I've never seen a stick like that. You know, it's, it's, but it's a staff. This staff is very simple. It's just a shepherd's crook. But God uses it to do extraordinary things. He turns it into a snake. (laughs) So it turns into a snake in front of Pharaoh. He uses it to turn the Nile to blood and uses it in some of the other plagues. That staff, that ordinary staff, was used to open the Red Sea. It was also used to hit a rock and bring water out of the rock. And it also won a battle for Israel. It was quite a staff. The staff was perfectly ordinary. But in the hands of Moses, in relationship with God, God could make it extraordinary. In Judges, you have Samson. And I always love Samson. You know, I always, I, I know you all laugh at me at this, but I always think, that's quite a gift, isn't it? You know, the world's strongest man. And whenever you see a Samson portrayed in, in film, he's always like, really, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, coming in. And, and the truth be told, if you saw someone like that, you wouldn't say, where does your strength come from? I, I think, it, I actually put it to you that Samson was like me, but with hair. He just, you know, he just, he just had lots of hair, and, but he, you wouldn't look at him and think, oh, I can see the strength, because it was 
God's strength through his hands. He could take a jawbone of a donkey and kill a thousand people. Now, I don't recommend that, and I'm not saying <laughs> that that isn't going to be our mission into Ridvale. And guys, get it out. Oh, here we come. You know, that's not the way we're going to celebrate Christmas this year. And it's just, but actually, God can take at that moment something ordinary and do something extraordinary. David, shepherd, suddenly comes out to take some sandwiches to his brothers. <laughs> Goliath. He takes a sling and a stone. And God can take the ordinary and do something extraordinary. Which is, who are you? You uncircumcised Philistine. Boop. He did extraordinary. The widow. Widow that Elijah goes to. Just can take some flour and some oil. And it just keeps being replenished and replenished and replenished and replenished. The extraordinary thing is we can read these verses in the Bible and think, yeah, but does that happen today? I grew up in a family where the story of God taking something ordinary and doing something ridiculous with it was commonplace. And that was my grandma and grandpa in Tlangaina. And it was the time of the miners' strike. And uh, not, not the one in the 80s. This is much further back into the sort of, I guess, in the, the 50s. And they had three children, and um, it was just, there was no work. And my grandma was in the, the chapel, and my grandpa was at the chapel, and he was at the front, and the kids were there. And during the offering, my grandma heard God say, whatever's in your pocket, put it in the offering. So she put her hand in the pocket and realized everything financially they had was in her pocket. And as the offering came around, she just, put it in the pocket, burst into tears, and ran out of the chapel. I'm sure my grandpa was thinking, oh, what's happened now? <laughs> she, was, she was a melodramatic woman, wasn't she? And so she kind of stormed home, and then she was in the pantry. She said she went in the pantry, there was a bit of bread, a bit of ham. She looked at them and was in tears, saying, God, this is all I've got to feed this family now till work starts. It's all I've got! Who, what do you think you're doing? And it had, she's in her words, and she would really play it. She was having a right old rage at God. Why did you tell me to do that? And then she could hear my grandpa coming back, and she thought, oh, I bet that awful man invited the preacher back for lunch as well. And sure enough, she had. And she grabbed the bread. She was really cross. She grabbed the bread, started cutting the bread, and suddenly realized it wasn't getting any smaller. And cut the ham, realized it wasn't getting smaller. Two days later, the mines opened up again. And she said that day the bread started cutting again. God can take ordinary and do miraculous. What has God put in your hands? What has God given you? And then you have the extraordinary tale in the New, Coven, in the New, in the New Testament even, where a little lad who was wise enough not to eat all his food straight away like all the adults goes following Jesus. And if you ever wonder why there isn't food, actually part of the thing is this. Jesus was so extraordinary that the crowd didn't want to go. They were supposed to be going to Jerusalem for the Passover. But instead, they've just followed Jesus because they want to see what he's going to do next. And as a result, they, they've got no food at this moment. They've run out of provisions. And so they turn up, except one lad. Got some loaves and some fish. That's what's in his hand. The disciples were tested. Well, how are we going to feed all these? And Philip does some maths and gets really upset because he realizes this isn't the time for administration. <laughs> and he can't. He says, three months' wages is too much to feed all these people. Andrew tries to be a bit more impressive. He kind of looks what is available, found this poor lad nicks his food. The reality is, you know, this lad's got enough food for him. And Andrew goes, no, I found some bread and the with my food. Shut up. I found these. This isn't enough to feed everybody. But it was. Jesus could take that, put it in their hands, and as they break it, he does something extraordinary. God can take the little and feed the masses. That was what he was teaching there. And then, when you think about that, that puts us into the next thing, because... Hands also a sign of spiritual authority. 
In Acts 8 verse 17, when Philip goes down to Samaria and then the apostles follow, it says, the apostles laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. It says elsewhere, you lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. Now, obviously, in a COVID time, sometimes people think, oh, how do we do that? How do we do that? Obviously, you need to get permission and things. But, but actually, there's still a place to, to lay hands on, to pray for the sick. You know, you can do the very Pentecostal thing. You can, you know, how do you do it? Hands are a sign of spiritual authority. And then you have the passage that Paul writes to Timothy his dear son in the fellowship, in, in the Lord, to encourage him. And that letter is all about encourage, encourage, encourage. It reminds him. Think of the sincere faith in your grandmother Eunice and your mother Lois. Think of the faith that's there. And it's also in you. There's a heritage here. You've got something very special. You know, this week it was John's mother's funeral and we drove a long time through the middle of nowhere, right the way through, we went through Abergavenny and then we're kind of heading towards Hay and Wye, but then cut across left and drove into the middle of nowhere. It literally was the middle of nowhere, wasn't it, Graham? And there in the middle of nowhere is a chapel that could seat about 100 people. It's old, old chapel. And there it was, and the thing that hits you as you get there is this. Where did the people come from to come here? Where? Where? Because there's nowhere near. It could only have been farmers. There was once a day when there was a need for that chapel because there was a heritage in this nation where a hundred people would walk hours to get to church. And you sit there and think, wow, God, if you did it then, you can do it now. If you did it then, you can do it now. Paul is encouraging Timothy. Think of the faith that's already in your family. Encourage you. It's there. But then comes this great line. It says, For this reason, I remind you, fan into flame the gift of God, which you received through the laying on of my hands. We receive gifts from God. God loves to give gifts. It's the very nature of God. He just pours out gifts on his church. In this room, there are many, many giftings that God has given you. God has put things in your hands. God has given you gifts. I tell you, doing the Bible studies, there are moments you sit there and think, wow, the insight. Like, I've got to say, Anna can sometimes be classic. <laughs> that she's, she can be completely silent. And then the last thing, just as we're about to end it, she'll suddenly say, is this what David's meaning? Oh, yeah, that's brilliant. Well done. It's just, bang, it's there. God gives gifts. Our responsibility is to fan it into flame. Our responsibility is to see that which God has given, what God has put in our hands and say, I will use this for your glory. And then Paul writes, but you have not received a spirit of timidity, but a power, love, and self-discipline. And I just want to encourage us, as we're coming back together, it's amazing having... For nearly 18 months, just watching services online, there are certain things that we don't do. And one of them is act in spiritual gifts. You know, so there hasn't been much singing in tongues online, you know, strangely. It hasn't prophecy. The gifts that God has given us. As we're coming back together, don't let timidity rob you. Because I did a little Tuesday thought on this this week, but it's this very simple thing. Most of us actually feel timid. You know, sometimes you look at people and say, oh, they're not timid. Actually, you know, I know I'm timid when I walk into a room of a load of people I don't know. And, and it's always intimidating. So I'm always, I'm, I think you've done amazing today. <laughs> just, just saying, I know you're overcoming your timidity. You know. But no, I just, I just think, always think it's, wow. I, I, you know, it's, we have a running joke, which is I dislike weddings. Not that the weddings are great. I dislike the reception afterwards. Because what nearly always happens, especially if I've done it, the family then put us on the table with all the non-Christian relatives that they want us to, <laughs> want us to lead to Christ somehow during this time. And you kind of sit there. And I, the amount of times I've sat there and all the kids are on their own table and they all look like they're having a whale of a time. And we're there stuck with the miserable... Anyway, kind of like, you know, it's like... <laughs> I, and it's all going... I, I sit there and think, I don't like this. 
We all battle timidity in some ways. We also battle this. I don't want to move in my gift. I don't want to look like I'm, I'm, I don't want to look like I'm showing off. I don't want to feel like, oh, I'm doing something wrong. But actually, this, he says this. You have not received a spirit of timidity, but power, love, and discipline. So actually, the reason we want to take that which God has put in our hands and say, I want to use this for, my, for, for your glory is because we've received power, but we've also received love. There's a reason in 2 Corinthians where it has the great chapters on spiritual gifts, 12 and 14, in the middle of it, you've got chapter 13, which is all of the great chapter on love. Because fundamentally, the gifts that God has given us, our motivation for using them is out of love for others, not so that we will look, get the credit. God has given gifts because he loves the church. You can't tell someone's character by their gifting. You can just tell the character of God by someone's gifting. The character, you've got to get to know them. <laughs> but actually, part of the only way you can tell someone's character and their gifting is, are they fanning it into flame so that God will be glorified? So the question to you today is, what has God put in your hand? What gifting has he given you? In Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, it says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. <laughs> that which is in your hands, do it for the glory of God. God puts things in front of you. God gives you gifts. God has put things in your hand. And the question today is, what are you going to do with that? You know, I've, I've known moments leading lots of different churches in different situations where someone will come to me sometimes and say, God's really spoken to me about this, 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 and this, and this. And then they look at you and say, what are you going to do about it? And you kind of sit there and think, I'm not going to do anything. Because God spoke to you <laughs> about it. You know, don't you put it in your hands. Don't then say, catch! <laughs> because, you know, I know I can juggle, but I don't want to juggle that many things. You know, I want to do that which God has put in my hands to do. And part of that is creating an environment where God can gift his people and people can go for it. Thank you for helping out my wife. <laughs> then God's going to do it. And, and yeah, that, that actually, we... We do that which God has given. So in this room, there'll be things that God has spoken to you about. And you could be looking at it and thinking, well, Andrew's done nothing about that. Why? Because God hasn't spoken to me about it. But actually, you're creating an environment where you can go for it. And actually, we learn together. You know, there are things I go for sometimes which are just foolhardy. You know, like a bingo hall. You know, kind of, you know, there are moments, you know, hey, let's go, we've got a bingo hall. Hey, what are we going to do with it? I don't know. Let's paint it and see. And then it gets knocked down. But anyway, yes, you know, there are things we go for. But you go for it. So at the moment, we're going for the sports bar. It's in our hands. It was something God spoke. We had no other option. For years, we've been praying, wouldn't that be a great building to have? Wouldn't it be a great building? When it comes on the market, you can't say, <laughs> oh, let's ignore that one. Because it's there. Part of our adventure as a church is going for it. But actually, the strange thing is this. We all feel really peaceful about it, which is a strange thing. We've raised £100,000, which is crazy. We've just got 150 to do now. And you need to pray, because a new grant is going in fairly soon, isn't it? And that's the one which hopefully will get us free. But actually, do you know what? We're at peace. Because you go for that which God's put in your hands. And actually... We've done what we felt to do. The next bit's up to God. And that's exactly the same with your gifting. You do the bit that you can do and leave the rest for God. It's like that in doing evangelism, isn't it? You do the bit you can do. You share your story. You share your opportunity. You don't have to win the argument. The next bit is up to God. You do the bit that's in your hands. I believe the key to a useful life and service to God is not waiting for the right moment, but in using what you have in every moment you can. So often we can be waiting. Churches, we're just waiting for the moment. We're waiting for that moment. We're waiting for the moment. It's like the song sometimes where the introduction is going on and on and on and on, and we're all waiting. At some point we're going to sing. 
Oh, we should have sung a while ago. <laughs> We're back at the start of the introduction. I was in a church the other day where the person was singing, singing, and the congregation got so fed up, they all started singing, and the guy had to stop them to say, no, no, no. It was kind of an interesting moment. But what God's given you, go for it. What God's put in your hands, go for it. Well, so today, I want to ask you the question, what has God placed in your hands? What has he given you to do? that will bring glory to him. And whatever that is, use it for his glory. For you have not received a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So Paul wrote to Timothy and said, look, use that gifting or teaching gift. This is the moment. We've laid hands on you. We've prayed for it. It's there. It's also amazing that you receive impartation. Sometimes you're thinking, I don't, know, I don't know if I've got any gifting. Get someone who you think is gifting and say, will you just pray for me? Will you pray for me that I know what it is that God's got for me? So then God can take the ordinary and do extraordinary things. We're just a group of ordinary people. And to be honest, we need God to come to do extraordinary things. To change a community. To change lives. The way we're going to do it is by all of us taking that which God has put in our hands, raising our holy hands, using our hands with spiritual authority and doing that which God has put before us. If you're able to stand, let's just stand. Thank you. If you just lift your hands up in front of you. Father, thank you that you are a God who gives gifts. Thank you, Lord, that the success of seeing your kingdom advance is not up to one or two people, but it's you anointing your church to do it. And thank you, Lord, the success is because you promised it to yourself. And so, Lord, I want to pray right now that you would speak to us in this room. You would come and speak to us about what it is you've put in our hands, what it is you've called us to do, so that we can use that for your glory. Lord, I pray this week, speak to us, anoint us. I pray, Lord, anoint our holy hands right now to do holy works, to bring joy to your name in every situation. In your awesome name, please. Amen.